Well, it's great to see so many people here. Thank you so much for coming to the 14th uh, annual conference that the NBN holds. Last year we had 160 people or so in the audience. This year we're nudging 200. So that's, um, that's great. So yes, thank you very much for coming. <coughs> we um, uh, are indebted to sponsors that enable us to hold this conference. And I, I'd just like to mention them because it's been really valuable, their contributions. We're indebted to Habitat, <coughs> Habitat Aid and, uh, and CEH, the Centre for Ecology and Hydrology. We also, um, very importantly, I think, um, need to thank the University of ba Bangor and Land Use Consultants for uh, funding eight student places. So in, in amongst you somewhere are eight students funded by uh, those bodies. Um, if you meet them over coffee and lunch, um, welcome them into the network and transmit your enthusiasm. That would be great. Um, it's an exciting time in, for the NBN and for biodiversity recording <coughs> uh, more broadly. And um, I think that's pretty well captured uh, by the range of talks that we've got today. And I, I hope you'll find them interesting and exciting. Um, our first talk is the, our keynote lecture. And um, I'm very grateful to Professor Ian Boyd, the Chief Scientific Advisor for DEFRA, uh, to have given up his time to come and talk to us. Um, He's going to talk on biodiversity and earth observation, the future for big data in the UK. Ian. Well, thank you very much, Mike. And uh, it's a great, uh, great pleasure to be here. And I, I, I just want to thank the staff and the trustees of the NBN uh, for inviting me along. It's always a bit daunting to be uh, put up uh, for a talk like this as a keynote speaker in front of people who know a lot more about the subject than I do. Um, but I, I, I think I probably, from the position I occupy, um, have some things that, uh, to say that, that, that might interest you. Uh, because what DEFRA uh, tries to do uh, with the funding it has available is to help guide communities like this uh, to do things that uh, are not only good for uh, the community itself, but are also good for the government and, and the nation. And what I want to talk about here today is about um, essentially uh, how new technology, but mainly through Earth observation, is going to eventually feed in to uh, all the good work that, that, that you do, uh, and how we can splice together the kind of work you're doing with some of the, the technologies that are coming along. Um, these technologies present uh, fantastic opportunities. I don't think there's any doubt about that. I'm a real in, in enthusiast for these technologies. Um, but they actually emerge uh, in different ways in different subject areas, or the, 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 the benefits emerge in different ways in different subject areas. Uh, but we're going to talk, obviously, about biodiversity monitoring here today. But in the context of DEFRA, we are also wanting to use these technologies uh, to help with animal disease control, for example, um, and also in areas like um, understanding uh, how, how farming works uh, to the benefit of farmers as well, so that they can get uh, short time feedbacks on what's going on around them, um, and also in things like air quality monitoring, which is extraordinarily important. Uh, from the point of view of DEFRA, because it, uh, there, there are sort of major impacts uh, associated with air quality. So you've got to see this in a wider context, in that uh, we're dealing with uh, massive data flows here, uh, one of which is about biodiversity. Um, and uh, it, it, obviously the biodiversity data flow is an enormously important one to us. But I'd just like to... Uh, just make sure before I start, I ground uh, what I'm going to say in just a few uh, basic principles. The first one is that I want to be absolutely clear that everything I say is, uh, is, is about not um, undermining the excellent work that has gone on uh, already in biodiversity monitoring. There are traditional ways 
of monitoring, and those are going to remain very important into the future. So the notebook and pencil is not going to be disposed of, and the pair of binoculars and the uh, magnifying glass are, are, are going to remain very important. I'm going to come back to that um, in, the, in the course of this talk. The other thing is that when I talk about DEFRA, I'm talking about also Natural England, JNCC, um, Q, for example, Forestry Commission, uh, the Animal and Plant Health Agency, so DEFRA as a, as a wide body. Um, and when I talk about the NBN, I'm not just talking about the trust and the gateway. It's about the whole community. It's about the network of individuals right across the community that are contributing uh, to what we're doing in this area. So what I want to do with, in this talk is, is, is talk a little bit about where DEFRA's priorities uh, lie. Um, uh, and then talk about what the kind of value is that the, uh, the, the NBN brings to uh, an organisation like DEFRA with its various uh, responsibilities. Move on then to look at the, the, the context of the kind of new developments that are on the horizon, uh, mainly through Earth observation, but there are also a lot of other technologies that many of you will probably be uh, uh, aware of or familiar with. Uh, and then just finally uh, address the issue about big data, uh, because big data is a fantastic opportunity, but it, it is also a threat. Uh, I, in my research career, I've been dealing with data collection, uh, which has been continually uh, uh, technology driven, uh, so it's got more and more automated. And I've experienced in my own research career what I call data poisoning, where you get so much data you simply just cannot process it. Uh, so there are real dangers with, uh, with automated data collection. So just to look initially at uh, DEFRA's priorities, um, we published an evidence strategy in, uh, uh, earlier this year, it was actually in June, um, and essentially what that is saying is that um, not only do we want to uh, interact much more with organisations like the NBN, uh, but we have to continue to collect data um, around our responsibilities uh, for uh, monitoring essentially what the state of the environment is. Uh, in terms of evidence, what DEFRA essentially does is two main things. One is it monitors the state of the system that we have responsibility for. And that's the environment generally, but it's also farming systems as well, uh, and maybe um, the atmospheric system too. Um, so we have to monitor the state of it, and that means we have to have data flows to be able to say what the state of it is now, and what it has been in, in the past, and how we've got from, from uh, some time in the past to, to where we are now. Um, we also want to assess and improve delivery. Now, that's about operational monitoring uh, of, of the state of the system and reporting that back uh, uh, often to, uh, to statutory, statutory objectives. Um, we also want to supplement the implementation of the National Pollinator Strategy that was published uh, just a, a few weeks ago and, uh, very importantly, understand the valuation of the natural capital that we have um, in this country. Um, but as I said, what we really want to do is to make sure that we're working better together uh, because uh, the challenges are such, the challenges are not just with big data and things like that, the challenges are actually about managing our countryside that we, we cannot, and when that's the we in terms of DEFRA and its, its network, cannot do that without a community like this one. So some of the priorities that we have in DEFRA, um, uh, especially in the biodiversity area, revolve around monitoring uh, biodiversity. And the, uh, we have a, a, a biodiversity monitoring surveillance strategy uh, that many of you will be familiar with, or some of you will know that it's, it's, in the, um, uh, uh, it, it, it's, it's being manufactured or created at the moment, um, which is trying to uh, make sure we have an approach that is um, uh, uh, addressing the targets that we set under Biodiverse 2020. So we have some very clear objectives about what we want to try to achieve with biodiversity, um, and the monitoring surveillance strategy is about trying to uh, get to those objectives. 
Um, so we want to, uh, if I can get this working, how do we do this? Yes, here we go. We want to try to support national reporting and evaluation, uh, and that's about statutory reporting uh, and reporting against policy outcomes. Uh, we want to identify the causes and consequences of change. So this is the, the cause effect within the system so that eventually we can think about ways that we might want to intervene in order to change the, uh, the, the biodiversity potentially for the better. I think we've probably intervened uh, very effectively in the past to change biodiversity for the worse. It would be very nice to be able to ch change that around and uh, understand how we might be able to change biodiversity for the better in future. And that's sometimes about understanding natural capital, but it's also about understanding what ecosystem services ex exist, how important they are, uh, and pollinators are a good example of that. But the other objective of the, the strategy is to inform local decision-making. Um, uh, it's probably it's national decision-making, but it's also local decision-making, to make sure that the tools are available for the right decisions to be made at, at, at local scales. Now, what I want to do is go through a few examples of how uh, we might use NBN types of data, biodiversity data, in order to be able to achieve some of those objectives. Um, I mentioned statutory reporting already, um, uh, uh, because we've got um, uh, certain types of outcomes that we need to get to in terms of uh, 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 particularly addressing habitats directives um, uh, ob uh, objectives. Um, uh, and we want to we want to be able to oops, we want to be able to ensure that we are uh, showing very clearly the evidence that we've achieved the objectives that we have set for ourselves. And the European Commission, of course, is always looking over our shoulder to make sure that uh, that we're doing that uh, correctly. Um, we have. Um, uh, certain targets in relation to the assessment of wild birds and of course there are uh, indices like this here you'll be very familiar with the farm and birds index uh, which sadly is going down uh, one of the questions is how can we actually turn the corner in this and make it go up again uh, there are some other indices this is the bat uh, one that has been created uh, relatively recently that is showing an upward trend um, but I have to say, I think most of the indices that we see are a bit more like this than this. Uh, and as a result, we have some fairly major um, uh, 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 targets to try to hit in terms of trying to uh, change this general uh, direction of, of travel. Uh, we also use these, uh, these data to report uh, internationally to our Convention for Biodiversity targets. Um, CBD targets and, and uh, six of the, the UK uh, biodiversity targets rely on NBN types of, of, of data. Uh, a second uh, um, um, example of where NBN data um, is useful um, is, is illustrated here. This is work done by uh, Carly Stevens from Lancaster and it's uh, uh, sponsored by uh, GNCC and Natural England and a number of the other uh, countryside agencies um, and it integrates data from a very wide range of different sources um, uh, so you know this this is this is a, a, a very good example of how uh, a, a very large number of different people many of whom may be sitting in this audience at the moment um, have contributed uh, to uh, to the study um, it's about the spatial analysis of species distribution in relation to uh, uh, nitrogen deposition uh, nitrate deposition is one of our biggest problems in this country, um, uh, not only through diffuse pollution from, from farming, but also through atmospheric pollution, particularly into the uh, uplands where uh, uh, eutrophication is a, a, a big challenge for us. Um, and what this does is it shows uh, a relationship for uh, 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 Campanula uh, glomerata um, between total nitrogen deposition and the probability of presence. So this is a functional response. Um, and you, one could do this for every species in terms of nitrogen or a whole range of different types of um, uh, nutrients or other factors. Um, but what it's saying is that whoops, this, th this, this, uh, this flower is, uh, is, is pretty intolerant to high nitrogen uh, 
uh, deposition. And it's got confidence limits around it as well. Um, and one can start to build a picture of the kind of eutrophication stories or narratives that wouldn't be good for this particular, uh, particular species. Um, and you can also see uh, changes in that functional response depending on the species that is, is, is being looked at. So this is uh, Cladonia uh, uh, subulata, which is a heathland species, um, and it is much less tolerant uh, to nitrogen deposition. Um, and interestingly, um, we are finding uh, nitrogen deposition levels uh, sort of in this, in this area uh, in very many parts of the UK now, and uh, sometimes getting up to 20, uh, um, uh, I think it's micrograms per square metre or something like that per year. Um, um, uh, and, and as a result, we're getting habitat changes um, occurring. So what this tells us is some of the underlying rationale for some of these uh, species uh, richness changes that we see going on, but it also gives us the, the, the capacity to predict what might happen um, in the future. So a very important outcome from NBN-type data. Um, a third example is in terms of uh, non-native species, and uh, we have a very well-developed network of information flow from various different um, uh, uh, data recording sources through the NBN, into centralized databases, and then uh, potentially, if we see something coming in that is uh, potentially invasive, uh, we have uh, a, an alert system. So the NBN network, again, is performing a very important function in that respect. Um, I couldn't uh, give a talk like this without talking a little bit more about pollinators, because it's been a, a very important subject over, uh, over the last few years, um, and quite rightly so. Um, but one of the problems that we've faced, certainly in DEFRA, is understanding what policies to put in place because we simply don't have very good evidence about what the trends in pollinators has been um, over the last few decades. There are some studies uh, which uh, suggest that there has been a reduction in pollinators, um, particularly a reduction in species richness. But we don't have good data about abundance. Um, and we do need a lot better data about, about abundance. And the new pollinator strategy uh, stresses that we need to put uh, uh, more effort into that. Um, but nevertheless, I think we're pretty certain that there's been significant range contraction of many species, and many of those species are associated with specialised habitats. Uh, whether that's an indication that, that pollinator services generally have declined is quite another matter, and we need to try to get to the bottom of that. Um, but there's been a, a lot of work has been done with, with historical data collected from um, uh, 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 the, 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 the organisations that are involved with the NBN network. Um, and this is just an example of the kind of, uh, from uh, uh, Carvalho, Car Car Carvalho uh, et al., uh, the kind of outputs that have been uh, 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 developed, where we've got bumblebees, other bees, hoverflies, and butterflies here, showing uh, uh, the, the, the changes in abundance from the 1950s through to the late 1980s, and then from the 1970s through to uh, almost the present day. Um, showing actually quite a lot of variability, but certainly for bumblebees, um, over certain scales, certainly declines in abundance. Uh, so bumblebees seem to be particularly affected. So that would be the, uh, the conclusion we'd come to uh, from these kinds of data. Uh, but nevertheless, we need better data um, into the future. So basically, um, where we are at the moment is that we've got an excellent uh, NBN network, um, from a DEFRA perspective, um, we, we want to be here to help the network um, uh, develop and to uh, develop good uh, uh, products that are, are useful uh, to itself and to us. Um, we still have significant gaps in UK monitoring and surveillance. Um, the, we've got problems around the status of threatened species, uh, the extent of habitats, um, and we've got uh, problems about monitoring the state of natural capital and the dynamics of that natural capital, in other words, how it's changing, and that's what I mean by the pollinator 
um, uh, uh, abundance uh, issue because we, we really don't have very good information about changes in pollinator abundance. Um, but we do have new technologies that are on the horizon that might help us fill some of these gaps. Um, and uh, we need to work together in order to be able to find the balance between the kind of traditional biodiversity surveying that we've been used to doing in the past um, and uh, the, the new opportunities that are coming uh, over the horizon um, from these new technologies. So what I'd like to do now is just move on to these new technologies and to give you a, a flavour for what they might look like. Um, and it is just a flavour because actually there's a huge opportunity here for uh, inventiveness and innovation. Um, so I, I don't think that we can predict exactly what these new technologies are going to bring us because I think it's up to uh, imaginative individuals to grab the opportunity and to use them and to develop them. So one of the best um, examples of the opportunity that exists is uh, in, in Earth observation uh, through the new Copernicus uh, uh, satellite system. This is an EU program. Uh, it's taken, uh, or it will have taken when it's up in, over the next two years, uh, about almost four billion euros uh, to create. The UK has paid into that, so we've paid our dues for it. Um, and it covers a number of themes, land, marine, um, atmospheric, climate change, uh, emergency management and security. Um, but within that is biodiversity, and uh, we want to be able to make use of it for monitoring our biodiversity as well. There's a constellation of satellites that uh, will be launched over the next two years. The first one, Sentinel-1, um, is actually up now um, and is providing us with data. It, it started providing us with data a few months ago. Uh, and the data are freely available, so anybody in this room can access these data for nothing. Uh, the big question is, uh, do we have the skills to access the data and the skills to use the data? Because it's being chucked at us at a huge rate. So this is the data poisoning issue that I was talking about earlier on. And what we want to do in DEFRA is to reduce the probability that data poisoning happens and to make sure that the tools are made available for the wider community, ourselves and the wider community, to be able to um, use uh, the, the information. This is a, a, a Copernicus uh, satellite image. Uh, uh, it shows uh, London Heathrow here. Uh, this is the Thames and uh, the area of countryside uh, um, um, just to the south of London. Um, it, it, it's, it probably doesn't tell you an awful lot, uh, it, but it's, it's actually a, a synthetic aperture radar image. It's not a visual image. Uh, because the current Sentinel-1 satellite doesn't have um, uh, visual imaging on it. It's got, it's got radar imaging. Uh, but radar can tell you a huge amount. And the wonderful thing about radar is it looks through clouds. So uh, essentially, we're going to be able to get almost near real-time imaging um, from this satellite system. Uh, there's going to be a tool available pretty soon, which I guess will be available on iPhones, etc., which will tell you whether there's a satellite overhead now or not. So you could actually uh, do, be, be doing surveys at the same time as a satellite is actually taking pictures um, above your head. What DEFRA is doing with this is integrating this with a program called Space for Smarter Government. Um, and we have a £300,000, fairly small uh, uh, project funded at the moment in DEFRA uh, that's looking at six projects uh, that will try to make the Copernicus data more useful for DEFRA. Now, I want to emphasise that uh, the European Space Agency that is responsible for this and the UK Space Agency um, are both working very hard to make sure that the kind of data that comes from Copernicus is already quite useful. So it's already quite highly processed but we want to then just take it and tweak it and turn it into uh, data that is useful uh, for our purposes. And within the context of this project, uh, we have two strategic capability building projects and four specific business areas. The strategic capability building projects are a hub, hub and spoke data uh, 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 delivery and mapping service, um, and also the creation 
of a center of excellence in Earth observation. Uh, the four business areas uh, include uh, greening and cap, uh, upland monitoring, catchment sensitive farming, but biodiversity and ecosystem services and natural capital uh, are, are in there, and that's where the NBN links uh, are very important. So just to look at the hub and spoke um, uh, system, if I can get this to work, there we go. Um, what we are wanting to do is to make sure that the data coming in from the satellite system is, is put into a centralised processing um, uh, facility or capability that turns it into um, uh, uh, outcomes that can be used, let's say, in habitat e extent and condition monitoring, in environmental stewardship planning and monitoring, in forestry mapping, uh, for example. So these are, these are specific products that are designed to do things that we are specifically interested uh, in doing. An important aspect of this, however, is to make sure that we are doing this in what I call a scale-based way. Satellites are only one part of this whole monitoring system. So we've got a satellite up here, which is taking a pretty, pretty big swathe of the landscape, uh, although it's getting finer and finer scale all the time. And I'll show an illustration of one in a, in a, in a minute that's very fine scale. Um, but that can be integrated with, um, with aircraft, with uh, unmanned uh, uh, vehicles, uh, but then you've got the surveyor on the ground. And what we've been very good at doing, and what the NBN has, is we've been very good at doing this bit in the past, uh, but we've been a lot less good at doing this bit. And what we've not been very good at doing is integrating the whole lot together. And what we want to do is be much better at uh, integrating that. Um, there are some quite good examples already um, uh, in existence, and uh, uh, a project called MIAO, uh, Making Earth System Work for Biodiversity, which is led by GNCC, um, has given us some really excellent examples already. This is a map um, uh, which, uh, uh, of, uh, I think it's the North Norfolk coast, um, which is showing different habitat types, uh, 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 all in false color, of course, but it's showing the fragmentation of the landscape um, and one can see very easily that if you're a surveyor on the ground or if you're just out for a walk uh, looking for uh, uh, butterflies or birds or whatever it might be, um, having this available, sorry, having this available um, perhaps on your smartphone would be a very useful thing to, 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 to have available to you because uh, you would know where you are in a particular location you could say um, that you're in this, uh, this dark pink location. And in an ideal world, you could then start generalizing out that that, that location has, uh, uh, or what you're seeing within that location, is very likely to be repeated um, elsewhere within that type of habitat. Another example uh, of, uh, of, of, from the Miao project um, is looking at uh, a particular uh, uh, location here, which is a wetland habitat. Um, this is a very high resolution um, image from, from a satellite system called GOI. It's a 1.6 meter um, resolution. Uh, this is a, a, a spot, a French satellite, uh, with a, a 10 meter resolution. But here we have a, a sort of integrated image that's overlaying detail on other types of spectral uh, uh, features that's giving us uh, an impression of, of the wetness, essentially, or the, the hydration of the, uh, the habitat. So the pinker it is, uh, the wetter it is. Uh, so one is able to get um, some pretty uh, detailed habitat information uh, and habitat quality information from some of these types of, types of images. OK, thanks. Um, just to move uh, uh, quickly to other technologies, um, Many of you will have heard about environmental DNA. Um, uh, uh, it's used in the marine uh, context uh, quite a lot now because it's almost impossible to uh, detect and count uh, marine bacteria and viruses. Uh, and uh, environmental DNA through DNA barcoding is, is often used. And I think that's an area that is gro of growing importance and it's going to be potentially, I think, almost as big as uh, 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 Earth observation in terms of its impact, uh, because no longer will, for example, one have to 
uh, uh, trawl through a, a piece of um, uh, uh, freshwater habitat in order to be able to find whether there are great crested newts there, uh, it's simply just taking a water sample should be able to tell you whether they're there or not. There are other techniques, uh, uh, remote video camera traps, which many of you will probably be aware of, uh, GPS tracking and radar um, of birds, and automated sound recognition. This is something that uh, I, I certainly use a, a lot in the past because I used to work on uh, marine mammals, uh, particularly cetaceans, and uh, it's incredible the kind of picture you can get of um, a, a habitat that you cannot look into any other way than by just listening to the sound. Um, and obviously with bats and birds, uh, that's potentially going to be a, a useful uh, way forward. And by the way, the amount of data that is collected using automatic sound recognition is absolutely phenomenal. Even the, um, uh, even the, the Earth observation data coming from the, 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 the satellites is small compared with what is, is collected in this, uh, in this mode. So it's a huge opportunity. Um, we want to uh, 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 share the sampling frameworks with communities uh, like this and make sure that we get that linkage between the different scales that I talked about earlier on. Um, we're going to have to uh, share data platforms because none of us are individually going to be able to uh, afford, essentially, to run the data platforms in the way we have in the past because there's going to be uh, too much uh, uh, data. We're going to have to get better integration of species and habitat data. Um, uh, uh, this, this word integrating comes up again and again, but it's just about making sure that we get um, appropriate linkage between the different scales of monitoring uh, that we need to put in place. However, the bottom one here is really important, the uh, standardising of effort, um, uh, because I, if I was to say that there was one criticism I have, of the kind of data that we get from NBN type sources, it's that it's really hard to understand how much effort has been put in on the ground. It's, it's useful for presence absence, but it's not so useful for abundance. So if we can crack the problem of understanding how much effort is put in in any particular area, uh, then it will make the value of your data um, much greater in, than, than it has been in the past. So big data, I, I think I'm not going to uh, uh, expand on this uh, much. I've, I've, I've said quite a lot. Um, uh, the NBN Trust is already developing a very broad vision for, for, for its data management, uh, and uh, I certainly welcome that. Um, I, I think it, it, it could pitch itself at investment platforms for surveillance and research on biodiversity. Um, uh, but again, I think we need to do this in a, a, a more joined up way than we perhaps have been used to doing in the past. Um, we need to uh, uh, coordinate, which I think is pretty obvious. Uh, but in order to do that, we need to be able to attract the investment that improves these products and services. We've, got, we've already made a massive investment in Copernicus, a very s relatively small, modest investment uh, and DEFRA is prepared to make that investment to some extent, um, will turn that product into something that is very useful uh, to us in the longer term. So with that, I'll thank you very much for your attention. And uh, if there's some time, I'm happy to answer any questions. So thank you. Uh, we have time for a, a couple of questions. So. Um, any questions from the floor? Jim. Um, Ian, you spoke about the problem of um, integrating satellite data with ground truth detection. And you mentioned some technological methods of using perhaps smartphones and so forth, how you can make satellite data available to someone working on the ground. But what about just plain, ordinary mapping and the barrier there is, the cost barrier there is between good between mapping and the, or the availability of maps and Ordnance Survey's uh, position regarding charging? That's a, that's a very uh, interesting and very relevant question. Um, I'm not sure how much I should say about this. Um, I know the Ordnance Survey is under a huge amount of pressure from the top of government right now 
to change its business model. So you're, you're absolutely right. Basic map data, uh, I don't think, in the UK we have not got the business model for that right yet, and uh, there is a lot of pressure to change that uh, very quickly. Uh, because you're absolutely right, getting really high quality map data is very important. The one area where it's, um, it's, it's been illustrated where it is having high impact in the right places was in the flooding uh, uh, last winter when we suddenly found that yes, we had uh, good data about the hydrology and we had good data about the metrology and everything else, but we couldn't put it instantly on a really good base map because the Ordnance Survey wasn't really playing, playing ball with it. So uh, the questions are being asked in the right places. I think that's all we've got time for, I'm afraid. Um, so uh, thank, if we thank Ian for his talk. <laughs>
So where do we get our records from? Well, this is the process that's happening at the moment and it has been happening for some time. So we in the Trust have ex access to a wealth of knowledge and expertise surveying our land for us. This includes our internal biosurvey team um, from our central offices and other staff, volunteers or other external interested parties or external contractors. The information is then fed through to a central contact or regional contact, or such as a volunteer, who will input the information into our internal National Trust database. And we're currently using Recorder 6, which has 450,000 species records within it. The species records are then sent to the NBN Gateway, um, and these uh, we've recently uploaded 260,000 um, species records which have been submitted to NBN. Um, so the process is working, although it was very recent and I'm not sure they're available at the moment on the NBN yet. Um, the NBN Gateway makes all of our data available to everybody, so our volunteer surveyors can see their records um, feeding into a UK-wide network of records. Um, and also, as John said earlier, the 100th million NBN record did come from our Wimple estate. Um, this was uploaded in September, earlier this year, and was a two-spot ladybird which was recorded by Peter Kirby. So whilst this is the process that's been happening and happening for a while, I just also wanted to highlight that it's not perfect. Um, so as represented by the, um, the dashed lines, um, some information may feed directly into the NBN without coming through our internal database. And we are aware that this isn't happening and it's an increasing trend. However, there may also be other data that we're not, we're not aware of that it is on our, um, on our records. Um, so it, it, it isn't perfect. And a key question that we have is, as a large loan, landowner, we have a lot of data. And how do we make sure we see sight of everything? So as I mentioned, um, we do aim to have all our records updated to NBN. However, it isn't a perfect world. Um, and the challenge for us is the varying number of records submitted by each property. And these broadly fall within three categories. So firstly, um, our properties where all or most records are submitted, such as, such as Wick and Fen, which ha currently has 97,000 uh, records of nearly 9,000 species, of which the Fen Violet pictured was one that was recently found again this year. Um, up to, updated to NBN and an ongoing programme of updating, uploading records. The second category is where we have records that are known but not yet submitted to our internal databases or the NBN. And this includes um, surveys that we know have been undertaken in meadows and gardens and arable flora, including the weasel snout um, pictured um, in Wales recently. So these, these records aren't yet uploaded to databases. The final category is where we simply do not know we have any records for, and this does include most of um, the gardens for the National Trust. And a key question, again, is how do we deal with the disparity of records being submitted from our properties? So I'd now like to give two examples of where we've benefited um, from holding land forever for everyone and access to a large range of expertise, including volunteers. The first one is looking at butterfly data collected by our volunteers and staff um, over a long time series of 20 years. This data was included in a report by the National Trust on Butterfly Conservation. Um, the figure on the diagram shows a composite trend in species abundance um, index of specialist group of butterflies, including the fritillary butterflies and the poor bordered fritillary pictured. Um, over the 20-year period, and there are two key messages that we find. The, the first one being that in virtually every year recorded, the abundance index on National Trust land highlighted in the blue is significantly greater than um, on non-National Trust land highlighted in the red. But that's not all. The second key message, which is um, also very interesting, is that the linear trend line represented as the dashed line here on the diagram has shown to be increasing over the 20-year period on National Trust land, whilst for the same time period it's been decreasing on non-National non Trust land. And is this perhaps high, um, related to our land management for these specialist species on our land? Another example of comparing long-term records um, and tracking changes and involving our volunteers is the Cyril Diver project on the Studland Peninsula. So um, here's the Studland Peninsula in Dorset, near Swanage, 
This is our wider Purbeck estate and another property for the National Trust, Corfe Castle. This involved looking at original biological records from the 1930s, undertaken by Captain Cyril Diver, pictured here, with a group of fellow enthusiasts that had a look at surveying the habitats and species. So this was a really, there's a really precious record of um, the habitats and species occurring on the Studham Peninsula pre-war, as Captain Cyril Diver was called to the war efforts. The current project commenced in 2012 and is a three-year project um, led by our project officer David Brown, comparing the historical records from the 1930s to today through a series of modern-day surveys and workshops. There are three key reasons why we're undertaking this project. Firstly, to build on the historical information that we have for the site. Secondly, to identify any changes over the previous 80 years um, and help inform any future management. And finally, to help connect people with nature, so helping to connect the volunteers and engaging our volunteers um, with the habitat and species information at the site. Since the start of the project in 2012, 1,601 volunteer days have been involved in the project, including um, those from experts to unskilled. It's mainly been biological recording, but we do have um, over 80 boxes of Cyril Diver's original field notes, photographs and diaries that we're looking and working to conserve so that we can make these available to both current researchers and the wider general public. You can learn more about um, the Cyril Diver project if you're interested from our um, website or they do also have their own Facebook page. So I also wanted to discuss connections and in the spirit of Lawton's review of bigger, better, more and joined up. The challenge of landscape scale conservation is at the moment our knowledge of how to track added value is in its infancy. By joining up, how do we know we've added extra value for nature? So a key question is, does one large landscape equal the same as four previously split component parts or would it equal more? And how do we define the measures of success? What helps us to inform why, where and how we join up and make the best uses of our resources, such as volunteers? Is it purely economy and scale, for example, staff resources or fencing costs with one larger perimeter? Or could it perhaps be more related to species populations? So, for example, bigger populations that have a greater chance of being more genetically diverse and greater resilience um, and in a, a greater position to, to deal with the factors of change, such as climate change. The National Trust as a large landowner has the ability to be able to look at areas where we can look at joining up land and connecting nature with nature. For example, um, the site on the slide is our Wiccan Fen Reserve, um, the original nature reserves up here in the top corner, which um, we acquired in 1899, so it's our first um, nature reserve for the Trust. And in the bottom half of the photo, is our vision land um, and this was acquired and has been acquired as part of our Wiccan Fen 100 year vision project which is looking at joining up a landscape scale project to develop a sustainable and natural Fenland landscape. So since this time we've been acquiring um, an arable farmland and looking at restoring it back to semi-natural habitats. However, it's not only connecting nature with nature that's important to us, connecting people with nature is also important, as volunteers contribute to our core purpose. They help to tell the story of our special places, and if we want to people to reconnect with nature, we need to get them involved. As technology advances, and we hope there's an ability to be able to engage people with biological recording and modern survey techniques as an opportunity to help promote our special places. People may also be able to help with the recording of landscape scale conservation, from experts to those that might be less skilled in identification, that may be able to help um, identify more easily identifiable species and find out if they're increasing in range or abundance. The key species that we can track and see if they're attributed to land being more joined up. For us, this may be achieved by promoting and encouraging citizen science, of which a, bit, a little bit later I'll give an example of a project that we're looking to do next year. Which leads me to biological records of the future. So the State of the Nature report highlighted that UK species are in a state of a decline, with 60% of species having declined in the last 50 years, and suggesting that climate change is having an increasing impact on UK nature. Future climate models and species distribution models may help predict what and where habitats 
of, and species are occurring in the future as species move their range, adapt where they are, or die out. One of the best examples of an expanding species is the Roselle's bush cricket, um, which was confined to a few places on the south of the coast of England in the 1980s. Since that time, it has been expanding its range and was found in our Wiccan Fen um, estate in 1988, as we have records for it, and um, has been moving up through Lincolnshire through the remainder of the 90s. These species and others such like it are moving because they can disperse. However, in contrast, other species, such as the sand lizard pictured, um, will have a lower power of dispersal, like a lot of amphibians and reptiles, and will not move unless we help them. This involves a potentially controversial suggestion of introduction of species at new sites where climate change is providing new um, opportunities for habitats where such species were not originally recorded in, in historical records, but it, where it is now suitable for them. And a key question that we have is, should we now such in, encourage such introductions? And how would we record biological recording in these habitats? Um, so in, in addition to landscape CL conservation, again, people may also be able to track the dispersal of new introductions, such as amphibians that may be found in local ponds, and reptiles that may be found in heathland or other open spaces where people commonly walk their dogs or um, spend their time. But I also wanted to mention new habitats. As some species will adapt and use new types of habitats, such as industrial and post-industrial landscapes, where thin toxic soils an unusual assemblage of species uh, make up part of their characteristics. Thank you. Including former wastelands, brownfield sites, and Budlia scrub. Areas attractive to invertebrates such as butterflies, which for the National Trust is likely to include our gardens, which have high wildlife value. And the final thought for this slide is, if species are moving to these new habitats as they respond to a changing climate, are we thinking now about the importance of monitoring these habitats and who is doing the biological research here? So um, as a summary of the trust, I wanted to highlight that as an organisation we have a number of key strengths in regards to biological recording, but also challenges as we move forward. So some of our strengths include our significance that we do own land forever long term and we do have access to lots of volunteers and expertise. But our weaknesses are that we've got a lot of land, we've got a lot of data, and severe capacity limitations. We've struggled to keep a track of the data. And the challenge is, how can we improve efficiency without losing the quality? We'd very much welcome any suggestions that you may have. Myself and my colleagues will be around for the rest of the day, so if you do have any suggestions or ideas how we could improve this, then we'd be very um, welcome to hear them. Our threats are not knowing who has been or who is now recording what on our land. But our opportunities are wider engagement with a wider audience and more diverse records. Collecting data is important. It helps us to tell a story. The more people that we get involved, the wider the understanding. However, the challenge is, how do we get people involved? And this links me to my final slide, which is looking at the future initiative we have. So to help with the challenges, we're undertaking this new initiative, which we hope to bind together in a series of BioBlitz events at coastal sites as part of our Coast 2015 celebrations. And Coast 2015 is celebrating the 50th anniversary of our Neptune campaign, which was launched in 1965 and has been one of the longest running and most successful campaigns within the Trust. It's helped us to look after and acquire the 1,200 kilometres of coastline which I mentioned we own today. These events are a quick and fun way of engaging everyone from experts to unskilled people and helping to generate biological records for these special coastal properties for the Trust. They're being undertaken between April and October next year and we do hope that you'll be able to join us. Our properties taking part are highlighted on the slide but I also do have a small number of um, flyers if you'd like to um, pick up one if you're interested which do have the dates and also some contact information on them. And you may also notice that we're also including our Midlands region. So we have a site at Kinver Edge. So not a coastal property, it's a landlocked. Um, but this has been included because um, it's a lowland heathland on sand and it does have um, habitats that do look and um, act like uh, sand dune, but it also includes the very rare grey hair grass. So that concludes our last example of both um, past, present and this new future initiative of biological recording on our land. Um, we'd like to thank the following people for their help in putting information for this talk. And thank you ever so much for your time this morning. Thank you.
So We've got time for one question, if, if there's a question for Katie. Oh, down here, Steve. Do you want to wait for the microphone? That'd be great, thanks. Hi, from Hello. your talk you've got, or oh, the Trust has responsibility for some hugely important land, um, and some of which, um, from your example with the butterflies, um, can be a lot better than potentially than what um, outside of Trust land. And yet, um, from all that, from all the years, you've got 450,000 records in total, which seems to be a huge amount of under-recording for the sites which you have responsibility. Um, so it would be really good to find some way of improving on the quantity as well as the quality of information. And you also have 4 million plus members. And there would seem to be huge potential for getting them involved in biological recording if you are going to be connecting people with nature as well and finding some system of online recording perhaps which they can use linked to the sites um, would seem to be a great way of getting people locally um, recording on their local sites and contributing to the National Trust database and to the NBN. Yes, yes, thank you. So as part of our BioBlitz events, we are looking to have a page that will be available on our external website where people can upload information um, to us. And we're looking to be able to um, use this continually throughout. So it is a challenge for us, as, as I mentioned earlier, having that the, the, the data that out there that we, we, we know that is out there, but it's, it's not in our systems. Um, so it is something that if you, do have, if you do have any suggestions on how we might be able to improve that, I'd really appreciate it. Um, please do come and, come and see myself or my colleagues um, this morning. Or We'll be here for the rest of the day. So thank you. That's great. Let's uh, give Katie a round of applause. Thank you. That was great. Fantastic. Right, so um, uh, next up we have Matt Davies, from Operational Manager from uh, Green Space Information Greater London. I went to meet with them before I'd even started in my job, and they're a remarkable team doing a remarkable bit of work. When I, said, when I heard about what they were doing, I said, go, you should really daylight this. And uh, Matt didn't have a clue what daylighting meant, so it's great that he's giving a whole talk about it now. So um, um, I'm looking forward to hearing what he's got to say. So come on up, Matt. Okay, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk to you today. Um, as John said, my name's Matt and I'm the Operations Manager at Green Space Information for Greater London, which is the capital's environmental record centre. Um, I'm going to give you a brief introduction and then we're going to look at a range of projects that Giggle have been working on uh, over the last few years that really fall into two categories um, that I think kind of encapsulate the work of a record centre. There's those that uh, turn data into information and there's other projects that are more about people engagement. Um, I certainly can't take the credit for a lot of the work that I'm going to demonstrate today and I'm really really lucky to work with such a skilled team of people. Uh, this is the team and uh, together we have around 60 years of experience working in record centres. Um, nor do we work in isolation. Um, we are actively engaged with these two umbrella bodies. Um, Mandy, the Giggle CEO, is a director of Alerc, and we also meet regularly with our counterparts in, uh, in the local record centres in the South East, so management and technical staff meet. Um, in preparing the uh, presentation today, I asked the MBN to provide some statistics for me to include. Um, and this is what I got back. Um, so on, on, the, on the left hand side uh, is, is all the data on the gateway and, it's, and you can see that a third of the records on the gateway come from record centres and 10% of them come from just seven organisations, the South East record centres. I think that's quite an incredible proportion. Um, and in London, as you might expect, Giggle records account for more than half of the records in Greater London. So this really emphasises the importance of record centre data to the gateway. Um, but it's not just about records on the gateway. We've also worked in partnership with the MBN Trust on a range of projects over the years. So back in 2006, we pioneered the use of web services to deliver information through a mapping portal on our website. 
in 2009, there was, a, there was an effort to try and designate the area around Charles Darwin's house, and this is his house here, well worth a visit if you're ever in Bromley. Um, the area around it, there was an effort to try and designate that as a World Heritage Site. It's where he did a lot of his work. Um, and, and, and during that project we created the, the Darwin Guide to Recording Wildlife, which is a really fantastic, uh, fantastic read. Um, most recently we've created citizen science forms, so this is kind of customised indicia forms on our website that allow people to record wildlife. Um, so that's it for the introduction. I now want to focus on a few of the projects that Giggle have worked on um, uh, over the last few years. Um, and I think for a lot of people, the perception of London is of you know, large-scale projects and, uh, and fantastic events, uh, spectacular events, and that's, that's, that's true. What's perhaps surprising is how many of those invent, events and uh, projects are informed by Giggle data. Um, Giggle data was used by the Olympic De Delivery Authority um, to help them site temporary car parks in the game so that they could uh, put those in the least sensitive locations. Other projects are more controversial, um, but we take the view that it's better that our data informs those decisions than is not taken into account at all. So HS2, Crossrail and Thames Tideway Tunnel have all accessed Giggle data. Um, so alongside the kind of one-off big infrastructure type projects, we also help work with organisations in the delivery of their ongoing operations. In this example, we worked with Transport for London to integrate our habitat suitability mapping. So this is some, some kind of mapping that helps people identify the opportunities for creating or expanding habitat. And we were able to work with Transport for London to integrate it into their GIS systems so that the contractors working on their behalf are able to see the habitats in those areas. It also enabled them to create habitat in strategic locations and to create habitat in ways that didn't risk getting leaves on the line. Um, in another example of working with an organisation to deliver their operations, we um, created these fact sheets with the London Fire Brigade, which enable firefighters to take account of, of uh, or to be aware of, sensitive habitats in going about their, their, their work. Um, alongside the kind of influence on the, on the ground, influencing things that are, are happening on the ground. There's also a body of work that we do to engage with people looking to shift public perceptions. Um, in this example, we, we, um, we provided data to a campaign that was asking Londoners to reimagine London as a national park in order to try and highlight to them just how green the, the capital is. Um, it resulted in a lot of uh, good press and a really um, eye-catching show at the uh, London City Hall. Um, in this example, um, what I want to demonstrate is that it's not just about... Some people don't have a perception of the wildlife in London. Other people really do. And I think there's a profession, as professionals, there is a general recognition that um, we want to encourage people to, to have access to nature. And there's been a long-standing target that everyone in London should live within a, a kilometre actual walking distance of a, of a, of a nature site. Um, so you may be asking why you're looking at a piece of string. Um, it's because it was orig originally, it was painstakingly mapped, uh, the distance from the access points to the sites using a piece of string. Uh, these days we have GIS and we do it in a fraction of the time, the map on the left, the yellow area, shows uh, the area that's within a kilometre of that park. The outputs from that project allow people to make boroughs, in this case, to make a strategic decisions about, about where they should be enhancing people's access to nature. It also enables them to 
make decisions about which, where they want to improve the nature conservation on a site. And in this example, at Mountsfield Park in Lewisham, an improvements to the, uh, to the management of the site led to the red area dissolving. So the area of deficiency in access to nature was relieved by improvements to the site. In this example, this example that the next project is all about combining data sets. Um, Tim Berners-Lee, the, the founder of the internet, or the, the inventor of the internet, uh, said that I'm not interested in your data, I'm interested in combining your data with other data. And that's exactly what we've done here. So we've combined this range of, of uh, environmental and socioeconomic data sets together to create a GIS data set that enabled prioritisation of resource allocation. So when you have a small resource, you've got to prioritise where to put that. So we were able to identify areas which were most in need of new street trees. Um, these are the output maps and they enabled um, a kind of expert panel to look at them and to decide whether it was uh, feasible to actually plant trees on the pavements in those areas. Um, thankfully they discovered that it was and uh, it resulted in 10,000 10, street trees being planted in the locations that we had identified in the modelling. Um, so hopefully uh, the trees like those on, like in the left hand picture in future years will deliver the sort of benefits that the trees on the, on the right hand side are delivering today. Um, the next example is about filling knowledge gaps. So conducting research to, um, to explain things. Uh, a few years ago uh, I realised that no one actually knew how much garden land there was in London. And I was able to work out that it's 24% 20, of the capital is garden land. But I still wasn't able to work out what was in the gardens. And so, it was, so we teamed up with the, the Mayor of London and with the London Wildlife Trust to fund a project that enabled us to analyse gardens using aerial photographs. In this way we could sort of peep over the, peep over the fence and see what was going on in the gardens. Um, it, it, was, it was incredible. It was, it was, uh, it was revealed that actually 14% of the whole of London is, uh, is, garden, is vegetated <coughs> garden land. That's an incredible resource for wildlife. Um, in addition, we were able to prove that the paving over of front gardens and back gardens was actually happening. Previously, the, there had been anecdotal evidence, but we were able to prove that. And this, this research continues to inform the debate about the value of gardens, and it continues to inform the debate about their protection in the planning system. It, it attracted an enormous amount of press, and you really know you're doing something right when you've, when you've, uh, when you've annoyed Jeremy Clarkson. <laughs> As well as the kind of raising the awareness in the in the press, um, we we raise awareness via our website, and the the online maps there allow allow the general public to find parks and natural spaces to visit, um, and to try and to encourage them to visit them. It also allows them to visualise geology and rivers, um, and the. The range of data sets that are delivered on this website has really snowballed over the last year, um, such that there are now quite, quite unusual data sets are available through the interface, um, wildlife crime being one of them. In a project where we work with the Metropolitan Police and with World Animal Protection, we, we were able to highlight the gruesome but really important issues of wildlife crime um, and allow residents to see the relative areas where uh, of, of cases being reported. So that's, that's, that's all the sort of projects that I want to demonstrate to you today. Uh, the, the final, the final uh, bit of the presentation, I just want to reflect on, on the other aspects of our work. So as a community interest company, the, all the work that we do with the, with the funded, funded work that we do for partner organisations allows us to work with the volunteer community um, last year we mobilised over half a million new records by working with the, largely by working with the recording societies in London. We 
we did over 400 hours of work for free of charge with those, with those volunteer groups. Um, but it's not just about digitising of information. We're also able to provide information to those groups. So there's over 600 friends of groups in London um, working to manage their parks. And we were able to provide some of them, those that requested it, with information relating to the species and habitats on the site to help them make improvements on those sites. Um, alongside that work, we also look to engage people online. And there's nearly 2,000 people read our newsletter. Um, and we have now over a thousand people following us on Twitter. So we're really hoping to, to get the message out there. Um, I found it really hard to decide which projects to include today. We've, we've worked on so many great projects. Um, I hope that you've enjoyed listening to them and, and hearing about them as much as I enjoyed working on them. Um, in a moment, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take questions and I'm going to put my contact details on the screen um, be very happy for you to stay in touch or to follow us on Twitter. Um, I think the, the final message that I, that I wanted to, uh, to leave you with is that I think through collaboration, innovation and engagement, record centres can really be the local nodes of the MBN that enable the MBN to achieve everything that I think the MBN should be achieving. Thank you. So you can see why I told him that he needed to daylight what they're doing and giggle. Um, I'll take some questions. We've got time for questions. Tom at the back. Cheers. Uh, Tom Hunt, Alert. Uh, Matt, knowing what you know about uh, other record centres, around the country, how much of the work that you've uh, daylighted today do you think could be picked up in, uh, in other parts of Britain? Um, <laughs> knowing what I know about other record centres. Uh, I think Giggles, Giggles I mean, we've, we've been very successful in, in, in attracting funding and and building such an excellent team of people. And that really gives us the kind of the skills base and the network through which we can deliver these projects. So not all record centres would be as well resourced as Giggle, nor would they necessarily have access to the data sets that Giggle have access to. Um, but I think if I could be so bold, you know, Giggle can be almost a beacon of, of kind of what, what record centres can achieve, given, given the right environment, given the right resources and the right sort of funding. Um, I think that would be the, the message I would say, that, you know, we, these projects should and probably could be delivered uh, across, the, across the country. Well, another question? Here in the middle here. It's quite a problem funding local wildlife data centres in Yorkshire. Um, it would be interesting to know how you've done it. Okay, I think the, the key person you need to speak to about that, and I suggest you go and speak to her in, in the break, uh, is Mandy Rudd, the Giggle CEO. So she's, 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 uh, she's genius and you know, has the oversight on everything here. And so, she, but I, I think the thing about London that I would say is that there are 33 different kind of... Uh, there's 33 borough councils, and there's, there's all the kind of, so there's Natural England, Forestry Commission, and all this sort of thing. So there's, there's a kind of, and there's a lot of interest in projects in London. So it, like London itself brings in a lot of funding, and that's as true for the record centre as it is more widely, I think. Um, we also have a lot of borough councils, like I say. So, that's, so it is a slightly unusual and different situation to, to other areas. Um, but I think the key to engaging new audiences is being able to communicate your information effectively and put it to see your information in context. So to be able to engage people, you need to be able to see your data from their perspective. Uh, and, and if you do that, then you can de demonstrate your relevance to them. Well, yeah, I think we'll call it a, a, a day there. That's fantastic. Oh, Matter round of applause, please. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.